You may be seated, and if you would, turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4. My subject this morning, there is power in your hands. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let me put this thing. It's on silent. I don't know what it's doing. That's technology. Hallelujah. There's power in your hands, and I just showed you a computer that you can carry around in your hand, and there's a lot of power in that little thing, and it's in my hand. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is not moved by what it sees. Faith is not moved by what it hears. Faith is moved only by the Word of God. And the Word of God never changes, which brings me to my text, 1 John 5 and 4. I love this scripture. It says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Look at this. Even our faith. The Word of God is living. The Word of God is powerful. And God said, my Word will never return unto me void. So when you preach the Word, the Word goes out, and the Word finds its lodging. And when the Word finds its lodging, the Spirit of God moves. Because Jesus said in John 6, 63, it is the Spirit that quickeneth, it, gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The anointing is real. The anointing is powerful. And you've got to learn how to trust the anointing that God has placed in your life. This church has God's anointing. It's, it's prayer condition. There's fire on the altars here at Westmoreland. And you're in a good place to experience God, to experience his anointing, and to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Every child of God that's ever been born again should be filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues as the Spirit of God gives them the utterance. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Ghost. The Bible says he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And he sent the Holy Ghost to his church to empower his church so that his church, his body, could go about healing all that are oppressed of the devil. Look at 1 John 2 and 27, what John the Apostle said. He said, but the anointing which you have received of him, of God, it abideth in you. I want to repeat that. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. The Holy Ghost does not commute. He does not come and go. The anointing abides in you. Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will abide with you forever. So when Jesus returned to the Father, he left the church to continue his works. And Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also, and even greater works than these shall you do, because I'm going to my Father. And when he returned to heaven, he sent the Holy Ghost to anoint his church so that we could continue the Lord's ministry. This is not my ministry. This is not the ministry of some persons that people would think you want you to think. This is the Lord's ministry. And we are vessels. The Bible says we're to be vessels of honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, and prepared for every good work. And the anointing of God is what prepares you to do the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, my subject this morning, there is power in your hands. Look at your hand. I want you to look at your hand. There is power in your hands. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the anointing. Thank you for the gifts, Lord, and the power you've placed in the church to set the captive free and to continue your ministry, Lord. Help us to be about the Father's business. Give us revelational knowledge. Help us to understand this great impartation of the Spirit that you've given to us. And help us to be bold in the power of the Holy Ghost to deliver your power to the world that's waiting for someone to come and set the captive free. And the church said in Jesus' name, amen.
Now, God has given his church two ways to minister to others. The first way is with our voice. The first way that you minister to other people is with your voice. God said, let that be light, and the Bible says, and it was so. God spoke the very world into existence. Look at Hebrews 11.3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made out of things which do appear. So we are created in God's image, and just like God, we are speaking beings. We can speak words, the word of God, and that word can change the course of a person's life. I'm looking at testimonies in here where the word was preached and that word changed the entire course of your life. That word changed your entire destiny. We can speak words that literally bring into existence something that has never existed before. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new, and all things are of God, who took the spoken preached word and caused people to receive that word through the conviction of the Holy Ghost, be born again of the Spirit, receive eternal life, become a child of God with their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's how creative and how powerful the word of God is. We can speak words, and those words can heal the sick. Look at Psalms 107, verse 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. And it goes on to say, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men, and, and let them, the children, offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of the calves of our lips, giving thanks unto his name. The word of God is living and powerful, and we're created in God's image. When we speak the word of God, supernatural things happen because we are carrying on the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. My Lord. I've had people tell me, while you preach the word of God, God healed me. I've had others tell me the word that you preached gave me the answer to the problems I was facing. I've had others say, how did you know what I was going through when you preached the word? God was speaking directly to me. See, the word of God has creative power, and we can impart God's creative power through our words. So the second way that God imparts his power is through our hands. He imparts his power through our words. Secondly, he imparts his power through our hands. Look at your hand. Look at both of them. It may look like an ordinary piece of flesh covering some ordinary bones. Mine is white. Yours may be a different color. Your hand, however, is not ordinary once you've been born again. You are called. You are chosen. You are anointed. And you have, whether you realize it or not, you have anointed hands. Hallelujah. God has called you. And God, when he called you, he gave you his authority and his power. It's up to you to realize through revelational knowledge of the preached word of God, the omnipotence that you have inside of you, and to release that power, that creative power of God through the words you speak to people, through the love you show, and through the laying on of hands to set the captive free, change the course of a person's life for eternity. Look at your hands. Look at them. Look at them. I want you to see them. They may be calloused. They may be worn. They may be old. They may be wrinkled. They may even be dirty or greasy. 
But that hand, that hand is a tool that God wants to use so you can minister to others. You may be a cook. You may be a mechanic. You may be a sonographer, you may be a nurse, or you may even be a doctor. You may be a businessman or businesswoman. You may even be a preacher. But whatever your line of work is, your hands are anointed. When I was working in the business world, I would stand in this pulpit at the other campus, and, and I would preach, and many times I would say, I am just as anointed to do business as I am to preach the word of God. I knew that was an anointing on me because God gave me ideas and I did things that had thought activity that was so far beyond me, I knew it was supernatural. I'm talking about million dollar ideas, ideas that saved that country company millions of dollars. Brother Philip Pearson worked in the world of computers, saving his companies, the two he worked for, millions of dollars. He didn't get the million. He might have been like me. I got an award two times, the President's Award, and they gave me $1,000. That was my reward for saving on a project a million dollars for that company. After Uncle Sam got through with it, I had about 500 of the 1,000 left. I gave my children $100 of it apiece. And I gave the rest of it to my wife. I didn't get anything out of it. But I did get the award, and I have two of them, thank God, for the recognition. Amen. Your hands have power. And what I'm telling you is God will use your hand to minister to others because your hands are anointed. There's power in the hand. And the hand is an instrument that God has chosen to pour forth his blessings upon the people who are around you. Have you ever been up to someone and you could just discern from their countenance that they were sad and you just laid a hand upon them or shook their hand and smiled at them? The power that was in that hand, because that's an anointed hand, you carried the very presence of God to that person. You may not thought it was a miracle, but God performed a miracle, and gave that person peace in that situation and in that storm of life. That's the power that God has placed in our hands to minister to others. God has given us our hands to work with. Many believers, they don't want to work. And if anything involves work, you can just count them out. They want to take it easy. They want the easy way out. But God has given us hands to work with. I love to work. Don't be afraid of work because when we work, God works. Let me say that again. Don't be afraid of work because when we work, God works. When God sends you on a mission, don't be afraid to do that. It may be just to cook a meal like the ladies did here this past week to feed a family whose heart is broken and shattered. But if God has anointed you to do that, do it because it is the ministry of the Lord. He said, if you give a drink of cool water in my name, you have a prophet's reward. It's not all about preaching. There's some work in this thing. And I promise you one thing. You can come check me out when I finish preaching a message. I'm pretty much soaking wet. But it's because I've been working. But I've been working the Word of God. Because I know if I work the Word of God, the Word of God works. And Jesus will set the captive free. Somebody go and praise God. Hallelujah. See, it's not my ministry. It's his ministry. And he's chosen to Paul said we have this, this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. It's Christ in us, working through us, loving others through us, helping others through us, healing others through us, setting the captive free and giving people joy unspeakable that's full of glory in a world of sadness and, and, and depression. We have to carry the light. 
And we have to pray and seek God so we can be that vessel with the power and the anointing of God flowing out. My wife said, you've been working on that sermon all week, Jerry. I said, I'm still working on it. She said, are you going to get it finished? Because yesterday was a tough day in many ways. I said, I got the end of it. I said, I don't know when I'll put it together. But I know one thing, I'll get it put together if I have to stay up and burn the midnight oil. So you just got to decide I'm going to work. I'm going to do this thing. And nothing's going to stop me because I'm called, I'm chosen, I'm sent, and I'm anointed. Look at your neighbor and say, look at your hands. They are anointed hands. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And see, I'm not counting on me. I'm counting on him that called me. I'm counting on him that called you. I'm counting on him that anointed us. So this church can go out and set the captive free and gather the harvest, the end time harvest that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's power in your hands. And the hand is an instrument that God has chosen to pour forth his blessings upon other people. Hallelujah. Look at this. Luke 10 and 2. Look at this. Look at what Jesus said. This is Jesus' sermon. Jesus said unto them, Therefore the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray you therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Like I said, when you get talk about work, some people, they just disappear. But God is a worker. He said, before the day was, I am he. I will work, and none can let it. None can stop me saith the Lord God of hosts. And I promise you something, when God calls you to do something, no one, nothing, not the devil himself, all his demon hosts, they cannot stop you from doing the work that God called you to do. Put your hand in that nail scarred hand and say, hey devil, I'm anointed. I've got Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Hallelujah. He placed his hand on me, and that's made all the difference. He said, you've not chosen me. I have chosen you. I have ordained you, and I have anointed you, and you are to go and do my work, saith the Lord God of hosts. Somebody go on and praise him. Your hands are not ordinary hands, my friends. Glory to God. The Bible says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. That's why I love to work. The Bible says, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Sometimes people just disqualify themselves by going back and dabbling in sin. Know you not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Present your body to God a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. Put off the old man and his deceitful lust, and put on the new man which is created in righteousness and true holiness. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Need I say any more? to those who are drifting away from God. Make your call and your election sure because he has called you and he has chosen you, but you will have to make sure that you are right with God each and every day of your life. Holiness. Follow holiness. And the sanctification, that's what one translation says, which is the will of God. What is God's will for you? For you to come, for you to go, and for you to be filled with holiness, filled with anointing, and filled with power. Hallelujah. Pastor Ricky, he recently shared how his grandmother, she was a preacher. He, he had a p- picture where she laid her hands upon him And she made an impartation of the anointing to him, and he felt the call to preach. See, your hands are an extension of God's hands. 
Let me say that again. Your hands are an extension of God's hands. My daddy, he owned a heating and air conditioning business. Those were anointed hands for the work he did. And he would tell me many times when he'd come in sweating and our conditions had failed and get over to the hospital working in on the equipment. And he would say, son, my work is just as important as those doctors in the hospital. Without that air conditioning, those people wouldn't be able to survive, son. His hands were anointed. My daddy played the guitar, and he was a great musician. And I have CDs that Brother Baker took some tapes and made them into CDs for me. And he played a beautiful guitar. He and my mother sang. They were anointed. My daddy laid his hands on sick people and prayed for them. I, I can remember him praying for me. That was power in his hands. Hallelujah. And I want to tell you something. There's power in your hands. Look at your neighbor and tell him, there's power in your hands. Tell him that. There's power in your hands. Your hands are an extension of God's hand. Your voice has God's voice in it because you are chosen and you are anointed. What are you going to do with what God has given you? Moses had a rod. What good will a rod do? Well, it depends on whose hand that rod is in. God asked Moses, he said, Moses, what's in your hand? And Moses answered, just a rod. Just an old dead stick. God said, throw it down on the ground. And when Moses obeyed and threw it down on the ground, that rod became a serpent. Then God said, take it up again. And when Moses obeyed, it became a rod again in his hand. It was a rod all the time. But God wanted Moses to discover the power that was in his hands. Hallelujah. Woo. Glory. The anointing is in you. There is power in your hands. Look at them. Hallelujah. God is not going to give you power. God said you are chosen. You are anointed. You already have power. What you going to do with it? I know there's power in my hands. I've seen God do the miraculous over and over again. I know there's power. In, in uh, Brother Philip Pearson's hand, I, I was, he was down at Falcon, and the man that could fix the drag line, he had gout in his feet, and he was the only one that could do it. And Brother Philip said, we'll pray for you. And they prayed for him and the, laid their hands on him. The power of God hit that man. He stomped his feet. He said, let me drag you over. He said, no, I'm going to run on over there. That's power in your hands. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. The anointing is in you. God has already given you power. Moses wasn't aware of the power and the magnitude of the authority that he had. And just like Moses, we have to learn to use the power and the authority that God has given us. And, and that's what I try to do. I try to preach it to people. It's the purpose of this message. When Moses got to the Red Sea, he had Pharaoh's elite army, the most elite army in the world behind him. The Red Sea was in front of him, and, and Pharaoh said they were entangled in the land. In other words, we got them hedged in. God said, stretch out your hand, Moses, over the sea and divide it. What good will a rod do? It depends on whose hand is in. <laughs> Hallelujah. When Moses obeyed, that sea rolled back. The people of Israel crossed over on dry ground. When Pharaoh and his army tried to follow, the waters came back, and the whole army was destroyed by the breath of God as Moses obeyed God and used what was in his hand. What will God do if you will use what is in your hand? Hallelujah. See, the God of Moses, he has not changed. He is still the miracle-working God. God has a miracle just for you. 
God's working on your miracle. One with just your name on it. Hallelujah. And he has others that he wants to send you to. And he's got a miracle with their name on it. And it depends on whether or not you use what God has placed in your hand. David had a slingshot. What good will a little slingshot do? Well, it depends on whose hand is in. Hallelujah. David went running at his giant with a rock and a rag, shouting, The battle is the Lord's. This day shall he give you into my hands. Are you going to just cower down and hide when the giant comes? Are you going to say, The battle is the Lord's. I'm anointed. Hasha, Kobo Shata. You come against me with sword and spear. I come against you in the name of the Lord God of hosts. This day shall he give you into my hand. I'm not backing down because you don't have to back down when God is backing you up. Somebody go and praise the Lord. I said you don't have to back down when God is backing you up. Hallelujah. There's power in your hands. David defeated his giant. I want to tell you, you can defeat your giant too. Moses had a rod. David had a slingshot. What has God placed in your hand? See, when you extend your hand to bless others, Jesus extends his hands, and he brings the necessary miracle. Let me say that again. When you extend your hands to bless others, Jesus extends his hands. It's his ministry. And he brings the necessary miracle. You, you don't know how many times during the week I cry out to God and say, oh, God, I'm just a man, but I'm called, and I want to obey you. And I need the anointing of your spirit. I can touch people's head, God, but I can only touch their heart through the power and the anointing that comes on a man, supernatural power that comes from another world. I could care less about eloquence. I'm like the old apostle Paul. He said, I didn't come with enticing words of man's wisdom, but I didn't come one whit behind the others either. Because I come in power and demonstrations of the Holy Ghost because I was called. I'll never forget that Damascus Road experience. I'll never forget when I met Jesus. I'll never forget the change that came into my life. I'll never forget how he called me and said, go to the street, call straight. Paul said, hey, Jesus said, straighten it out. Get your life straight because you're a chosen vessel for me. Protect the anointing. It's precious. Don't let anything take your anointing. Don't give in to the wiles of the devil. Pray, pray, pray. Say, oh God, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer, not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord. Just an ordinary man that you chose to put extraordinary supernatural power in. And God, I need help. Till you admit you need help. Till you admit you can't do this thing on your own. You'll never be anything in God's hand but a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. God said it's not by power nor by might. It's by my spirit, says the Lord God of hosts. God said it's not your way. It's my way. And all these churches got all these church growth programs and all that stuff. I'd rather have the anointing of God. I'd rather have the presence of God. I'd rather see people's lives transformed by the glory of God than have all the treasures this world could ever afford. The anointing is precious. Protect it. Pray over it. And draw nigh to God. And he'll draw nigh to you. And then when you resist the devil... You're anointed, <laughs> and that devil will flee from you. Somebody going to praise God. Hallelujah. 
Moses led the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. But it was Joshua who led them into the promised land. The Bible says that Joshua was full of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. Woo! See, the wisdom that Joshua needed to lead God's people into the promised land was imparted to him through the laying on of Moses' hands as power in your hands. When Isaac was getting old and he was too blind to tell his two sons apart, Jacob, the supplanter, Jacob, the deceiver, he decided to deceive his daddy. He put some goat hair on his hands and his neck to make himself appear like Esau, his older brother. Isaac asked him, said, who art thou, my son? Jacob lied. And Jacob said, by the way, get out of the lying business because you end up in hell if you tell enough of them, I promise you. Get it under the blood. Jacob lied. And he said, I am Esau, your firstborn. His father was skeptical. And he said, come near that I may feel you. Jacob obeyed. But Isaac was not satisfied. He said, the voice is the voice of Jacob. But the hands are the hands of Esau. Isaac was deceived. He laid his hands upon Jacob. And he gave the blessing to Jacob that rightfully belonged to Esau. When you hear the Spirit of God say, don't do that. Don't go by your feelings. Go by what your spirit man is telling you. Because when you go by your feelings, then you're setting yourself up to be deceived by the devil. We walk by faith and not by sight. We don't walk by what we feel. We walk by what the Word of God says. And if the Word of God says, that shall not, then don't be deceived and do it. Be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only. The Bible says, deceiving your own self. Nobody else calls you to do that sin. You sin when you were drawn away by your lust and enticed and gave your flesh over to that sin instead of obeying God. Flee fornication. That was in our Sunday school lesson this morning. How do you do that? Draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. I've fasted many times for, for 10, 21 days, 14. As soon as I come out of that, I hadn't, didn't watch TV, didn't eat meals, just prayed and read my book. And the first thing I saw when that TV was turned on was flesh. Some woman half clad. And the devil trying to draw me away. The Bible says, flee fornication. Put a watch before your eyes. We're in this world and, you know, we're going to be tempted. Resist temptation. God has made a way of escape that you may be able to bear. Who am I preaching to? Jacob knew there was something wonderful in the hands of an old blind man. He knew it was so wonderful that he was willing to use deception to get the blessing. There's power in your hands. The Word of God is filled with examples of what happened when hands were laid upon people. The miracle is in your hands. In the days of Elijah, the widow of Zarephath, all she had was a little meal and a little oil. She and her sons were going to eat that last cake and die. Instead, she gave it to God, and God multiplied it and fed the prophet and her son and her for three and a half years during a famine. What you got in your hand? Oh, I, I'll pay my tithe when, I, when I'm able to. You won't ever pay your tithe. Jesus said, if you're not faithful with a little bit, you won't be faithful with much. If God can't trust you with $10, he can't trust you with a million dollars. Pay your tithe and get things right with God. Amen. Give offerings to. In the days of Elisha, that was the servant of Elijah, the one who got the double portion, the prophet. The widow lost her husband and the creditors were coming to take her sons and everything because she could not pay her debt. So she went to Elisha, the prophet, for help and asked 
He asked her, said, what you got in your house? She replied, all I have left of value is a little pot of oil. But that was enough. Little is enough in the hands of God. God showed her how to use what she had to pay her entire debt, save her son, and still have enough left over to live on. As that little widow shut the door, got along with God, and began to pour out the little that she had, it just kept pouring, and it kept pouring, and it kept pouring. And God used what she had to meet that need. What do you have in your hand? My brother's in heaven now. He told me one day, he said, Jerry, if I had a million dollars, I'd give you half of it to build a church. I said, that's wonderful. How, will, how about give me that $20 bill in your back pocket? He said, no, I can't do that. I said, if you had a million dollars, you wouldn't give me half of it either. <laughs> Use what you have. I love my brother. and He's my brother. And he's in heaven today. Thank God for his amazing grace. Amen. The disciples fed a multitude of 5,000 men plus the women and the children. A small lad gave his lunch to Andrew. And he took it to Jesus. But all the lunch contained was five little barley loaves and two small fish. And Andrew looked at it. And he asked like all of us would ask, what good is this among so many? And Jesus told them, said, seat the people so that they can eat. And bring what you got and give it to me. You hear what Jesus said? Jesus said, bring what you got and give it to me. Then Jesus looked up. He blessed it. He gave it to his disciples after he broke it. And he, they served the multitudes. I don't believe that Jesus broke that bread and that fish into fifteen or 20,000 pieces each. I believe he broke the loaves till there were 12 pieces. I believe he broke the fish till there were 12 pieces. Then he gave a piece of bread and a piece of fish to each of his disciples. And then he told them, you feed the multitude. Jesus said, give them something to eat. In other words, he said, you give them something to eat. Disciples obeyed the Lord and they gave out what they had. The miracle took place. And as you give out what is in your hands, you will find the anointing is sufficient. And the miracle working power will be present. And the work of God will be done. Our nation is in big trouble. Why are we in such trouble when the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has the keys of the kingdom? is because there is division in the church, and the church is asleep. And if the church would just stand up and take her position of righteousness, and, and all of the atrocities of the current administration that are going on, they are a complete antithesis or just the very opposite of what the church world stands for. The church world is saying God is sovereign and God will solve all our problems. No, what has God put in your hands? What has God put in the hands of the people in the church? Why won't the leadership stand up, call the church to holiness, and say we're going to promote the platform that lines up with our articles of faith? And we're calling the church to prayer. And we're not going to, to be divided in the church. If you want to abort and kill little babies, get out of this church. Amen. Straight. We're not to judge those that are outside the church. The Bible said judge the things inside the church. It do some people good just to read their Bible. Hallelujah. My Lord, what you got in your hand? I got a pen. I got a brain. And I know how to vote. Hallelujah. And your vote may not have even mattered at all in this last election. Nobody knows what happened there. If you can't vote them out, praise God. We got the keys of the kingdom, and I guarantee you one thing. The church can pray them out. Hallelujah. God said what you got in your hand. 
I got some praying hands. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, I got some praying hands. Hallelujah. Glory to God. My Lord. When the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, take him captive in the Garden of Gethsemane, the first thing that they did was to bind him. I went back and read it. They bound him. When you bind a person, what do you do? Bind their hands. They bound his hands. Those hands had made mud, placed it on blind eyes, and healed them. Those hands had gathered the little children tenderly into the arms of the master as he pronounced blessings upon them. Those hands had stopped the funeral procession in Nain, and Jesus touched that coffin. He raised that young man from the dead, gave him back to his mother. Those hands had been laid upon the sick and the suffering, the helpless and the incurable, and Jesus had healed them all. So much power had flowed out of those hands that the enemy recognized that the first thing they must do was to bind the miracle-working hands of Jesus. Look at your hands. They are the miracle-working hands of Jesus. If the devil can bind your hands, he can keep you from doing the work of God. There's power in your hands. I got a lot more, but I'm running out of time. I never forget when I was a young Christian. See, Timothy, he laid his hands, Paul rather, laid his hands upon young Timothy. He said, I want you to stir up the gifts that are in you by the laying on of my hands. Paul laid his hands upon him. And when I was young, I went to my mother, and I told her, I said, Mother, I know I've been filled with the Holy Ghost, but I can't get an utterance. And she laid her hands over my hands, those little bony hands of hers, and started praying for me. And the Spirit of God snapped her back, and when she snapped forward, I was slain in the Spirit. And I was out for eight hours. I woke up at 3 a.m. praying and singing in tongues. I have never been the same. From that moment to this, there's been a, a river flowing out of my innermost being. Power and anointing. Because mother laid her hands upon me and made an impartation. Hallelujah. And all nine of the manifestation gifts have operated in my life since that moment to this very moment. There's power in your hands. Lay them on somebody and bless them. I'm going to end with this. Peter, the gate beautiful. There was a lame man there. That man had been there for many days. He was a beggar. He was asking for money. And Peter and John were going to the temple because they went to the temple to pray every day. They went by this same man that they would go by every day going to the temple to pray. But something was different this time. The difference was not in the crippled man. The difference was in Peter and John. He's begging for money. Peter said, I don't have any money to give you, but such as I have, give I thee. A few days earlier, in that little upper room, Jesus had laid his hands upon them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I want you to look at this right here. Because when Peter did that, he decided this is a good time to preach a little sermon. So I'm going to give you a little sermon right here. Look at Acts 3 and 12. The people marveled. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, You men of Israel, why marvel you at this? Or why look so earnestly on us? As through our own power or holiness, we have made this man to walk. I want you to notice that Peter put power 
and holiness together. If you want God's power, you must live a holy life. Power and holiness, they go together. Amen. We're in the last days, church. And the church must awaken from her slumber. Jesus is coming for a glorious, triumphant, victorious church without spot, blemish, or wrinkle, or any such thing, but it's going to be holy unto the Lord. God is going to pour out his glory, and we're going to see more creative miracles in the days ahead because the second coming of the Lord is quickly approaching. Miracles will not diminish. Miracles will increase as the bride of Christ awakens for his coming. According to God's prophetic calendar, we're on the verge of a great revival. God has promised through the prophets that he would pour out the former rain and the latter rain in the same season. There's power in your hands. And as your pastor, I want to encourage you to make yourself available to God for the anointing to flow out to others through your hands. The world is waiting for you to come. The world is waiting for you to give to them what God has already given to you. Look at your hands. Let us stand. There is power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. There is power. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Look at your hands. Yes, there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. To break, break every, every chain. chain. Break every chain. They will not take these chain. hands and throw that chain into the atmosphere. Things happen in the spirit world. There is power. Woo! That's faith. I just throw it by faith. I'm breaking chains of darkness, all people. Glory. There is power. power Jesus. In the name Jesus. Woo! Jesus. Hallelujah. Are you that yes, preacher with the chain? You better believe it. In the Jesus breaks every chain. Jesus. I'm not afraid to preach the gospel and lay my Break hands on people chain. and bless them Break with what God has blessed me to bless them with. Break the power of his spirit. Chain. The power of his name. The power of his blood. Break the power of his chain. word. Break Hallelujah. Chain. Break every chain. Let's come Break to the altar. Say, Lord, I want it. There's I an want army. you to show me how to use what you've there already given me. Hallelujah. Show me, Lord, how to use what you've already given me. Everybody come. If you're not saved, come up here and I'll lead you to, to the Lord. Rising up. Hallelujah. Brother Copa Peacock, There's he says, army. I feel the power in my right hand. Rising it starts burning. Woo! I want you to preach that word Break tonight in Jesus' name. As I lay my Break hand upon you, you will never be the same. Break Break Set him on fire, God. Set him on fire like a man from another world in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Glory. Woo! Be made there whole. Is power. Of Jesus. Hallelujah. Power Look at those hands. Your hands are an extension of Jesus', of Jesus hand. 